Hey folks, Jeff Salzman here and welcome to The Daily Evolver. In this episode, we're going to take a developmental look at the ongoing tragedy in the Middle East. And the podcast takes place in two parts. Part one is a talk I gave this last Wednesday night, October 11th, to the Developmental Alliance. And the second part is a more personal conversation I had with Encore Delight, who is uh, my conversation partner, every Thursday live on YouTube at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. So we'll start with the Developmental Alliance. Thanks for listening. Um, so yeah, so hey everybody, I'm happy to be here and it's really nice to hang out with you folks and try to bring an integral developmental perspective to this tragedy and um, yeah, and uh, see what we can do to solve a wicked problem, which is a problem that is defined by, uh, it defies solutions. It has multiple solutions. And ultimately it's a problem that has to be grown out of. And so the answer is more development as it often is, uh, but intelligent development, and we could talk about all of that. But I wanna start by doing the simplest of integral practices. And that is to become aware of where we are at this very moment as we relate to this situation at hand. So I invite you to do that. And we've all been marinating, or at least certainly aware of, the story as it's unfolding. And there are a lot of, um, you know, sensibilities that we can, that integral thinking helps us to differentiate and integrate. So we'll start with the sensitive self. And this is our green postmodern self that is horrified by the suffering and recoils and even tries to avoid it or becomes depressed. Uh, and all the atrocities, I'm not going to dwell on all of it. It's all quite very much online in the culture. And so we want to be aware of that part of ourselves. And we want to be aware of our rational self, the modern self, which is just in a way confused by all of this. How could it happen? What went wrong? Who was responsible? What broke down? What are the ramifications? How can we fix this? How threatened are we? And that is, you know, the self that is also online at the same time. And then there's the righteous self or the blue traditional consciousness that goes automatically to who's to blame. Our Blue traditional mind is always big, busy figuring out who's right and who's wrong. And actually, there's not a lot of figuring in a way. It's funny. It's, it's self-evident. It just arises. The dots are connected. Automatically, in our blue ethnocentric hearts, we know who the heroes are and who the villains are. And we tell a story from there. We start with the heroes and villains and tell the story from there. And maybe we tell the story that starts with the incursions on Saturday or the occupation or the founding of Israel in 1947 or Judea 3,000 years ago. But that comes online too. And we can feel into that, that ethnocentric self. Who do I relate to here? The Israelis, the Arabs, the white people, the people of color. We can see this in the culture that this blue self um, is, it's, you know, uh, there's a big blue strata in America and in all over the world. Most of the world is uh, pre modern in, in this sense. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second here. But I want to also get into the final stage that we're going to feel into, and that's the red level. The bloodlust that gets activated, and we think, you know, fuck those fuckers. We're right to fight against evil. 
They've been doing it to us way too long. We have to fight back with whatever we have. A lot of anger. This is the world of vengeance, recrimination, uh, you know, again, bloodlust, revenge. And we can see and feel into each of these energetics and worldviews, really. And we could see them in each other. We can see them in social media. We can, um, you know, uh, see that they're often at odds. And this is where integral consciousness comes in handy because at integral, all of that is welcome in a sense, in, in the sense that integral helps all of these energetics make more sense to fly in formation. And I, I, I like the word, there's a certain way in which it's powered by faith. It is for me, and I love that word faith, that sheer awareness of more, of including more of the story and the energies that are at play in real time happening under their own power, and how you could hold all of that and more of that is what is the road to being more wise, more compassionate, and more part of the solution and less part of the problem. And this is especially important because we see that all of these forces are not only at work in ourselves, but in the situation itself, the world at large, and that it is in various proportions and various cultures and stories and often violently combustible, as we are seeing now. So I just want to walk back through this these stages of development in terms of how they're arising in the world at large, or in this situation particularly. And if we look at uh, Israel and Palestine, the Israelis and, and Arabs, first of all, for those of us probably in this group, we know a lot of people in both cultures, or we know of people who are green. You know, there's a big peace movement. There's big movements for cross-cultural exchanges between Israel and, and the Arabs. And people who want to live in peace and see the humanity of each other and enjoy each other. And of course, there's the virtual world uh, of internet and social media. And of course, they operate on several levels, including red. But the, the, the arising of the virtual world or internet in general, just the perspective taking machine that it is. Uh, the multicultural effects are just hard to overestimate over time when we think about the next generation and the generation after that, especially when you consider how long these recriminations and these cycles of violence have existed. So anyway, I've been, the, 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 these peace people have been on my mind. I know some of them personally, and I, I, I know their hopes are dashed and it's discouraging. And, uh, and maybe in the best sense, they're all the more fortified. I don't know. But that's a piece of the green that we want to take into integral. You know, that sensitivity and the just the peace of the harmonious world. The other contribution that green makes to the situation is that it's politically critical. It's critical theory. They particularly criticize any power dynamics uh, and see the modern complicity in the creation of these pre-modern subcultures in, for instance, Gaza. And how Israel, the more powerful, you know, has created life conditions. And life conditions is, I always think about this uh, in terms of integral theory with Claire Graves and the spiral dynamics people, that life conditions are really what uh, creates the, the opportunity for forward movement in terms of evolution. And we generally uh, develop to the center of gravity of our culture by the time we're young adults. If life conditions is one of subjugation and domination, then that becomes the physics or the fulcrum of your worldview. It's what you wake up in the morning thinking about. And to the degree that there has been subjugation in Gaza, that is the life conditions that creates basically red. So we'll 
take a closer look at that in a second, but I also want to point out that Jews in general are naturally, in, 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 I was going to say they're naturally green and progressive, but actually it's they're in the vanguard of evolution since monotheism, and maybe before, I don't even know. But also in science, business, commerce, and postmodern thinking after the Holocaust, World War II, civil rights, Jewish people are reliably Democrat, devoted to social justice, and um, and often good social justice, because the green social justice, the, a lot of the social justice movement in the West is actually rooted in blue and red consciousness. But to the degree that it's about real social justice, this is the green we want to take into integral. So there's that. And then there's the orange, the modernity. And this is, of course, where Israel shines. They built a modern society in the middle of a pre-modern world. Uh, and um, they used pre-modern methods to do that. Uh, we would also say that modernity is a big story in the Arab world as well. Uh, there's the normalization, there's the Abraham Accords, there's potential normalization with Saudi Arabia. Um, but, you know, there has been a change in life conditions in the last week. And that skin of modernity that is arising in the Arab world and in the Jew and in Israel, um, you know, this emergence or this eruption of barbaric red violence uh, will knock people down a stage or two. You know, it's, it's the old thing, a conservative is a liberal who's been mugged. And that is um, so that's happening and we're seeing that happening. And so now we're getting down into the pre-modern ethnocentric stage. And there's a, plenty of that in both of these cultures. The I, you, you, we, We'll see just how badly knocked back Israel is into blue ethnocentrism right now, you know. Uh, and they definitely have potential because if you think about Israel, these it's populated by the Jews who were drawn to their ancestral homeland. You know, they're more ethnocentric than the Jewish diaspora in general. They want that Jewish state. You know, this is the dream of ethnocentric people everywhere. And we can feel that the the call of that cultural louche, you know, that liquid space where it's literally a we space in the quadrants, you know, the lower left quadrant. Uh, and, you know, we know who we are. We banish the infidels. We, you know, God smiles on us. And, you know, everything's going to be great until inevitably somebody comes along and, you know, some invaders or strangers and it's all ruined. And that is, um, you know, there's that that sensibility is big in, in, in Israel. And of course, it's the default in the Arab world. People identifying with their tribe, their people, you know, the, the skin of modernity in the Arab world is uh, as development, the nature of development, the higher stage of development dominates the previous stage. And so, you know, the modern stage was implemented in colonialism. But if you think about Dubai and Qatar and Saudi Arabia and a lot of these countries, they're, they have their own modernity that is arising. Still, the, the ocean of Arabs is blue. And, and then there's the, 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 the previous stage, which, and this is um, sort of characteristic in, in the worst way in the Middle East in general. And it's the blue-red. It's the holy, blue is holy, red is warrior, the holy warrior. And that's a really sour spot in history. And there's plenty of Jews here, you know, some of these aggressive settlers. And, you know, we've all seen documentaries and 60 Minutes on the, you know, they really hate Arabs. They, they, it's their ancestral homeland. They're God's chosen people and they're willing. And this is the, you know, that's the blue part. The red part is they're willing to die in the service of that. And you can tell the difference. It's like the mullahs in Iran, you know, the more they live in palaces, the more they're blue, the more they're willing to actually go up with a sword against Goliath or parasail into the enemy's territory that's the today's a good day to die, folks. Those are the red. That's on the red side of the spectrum. 
So um, that is, you know, what we're dealing with here. And from an integral perspective, there's, you know, a couple of things that we can think about and then we'll break into groups because I don't certainly know the answer to this, but I'll throw out a couple of things. Um, that, um, first of all, one of the things I love about integral theory is that the base um, starting assumption is that we want everybody to be healthy where they are. We can't make people develop. We can, you, you know, you can't make the rose bloom, but you can give it sunshine and water and keep it as healthy as possible. And it's what parents do with their red children and blue children as they, you know, you know, try to keep them from getting in too big of a mess. And that is, you know, kind of what we want to do. And we want to make a distinction between the modern and pre-modern center of gravity. Uh, modern people will live in peace. Pre-modern people really won't over time. They just, that's the, 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 the idea of conquering and, um, you know, uh, creating the, our God's paradise on earth is too strong. And so I think of Sam Harris's argument that if um, the Arabs laid down their arms, there'd be a Palestine. If the Isra Israelis laid down their arms, there wouldn't be any more Israel. And that's the difference. And we want to keep that distinction in mind because modern's better here. Uh, and um, and this is a, a, a couple paragraphs here from Tom Friedman today in the New York Times where he talks about this and the problems in Israeli politics, which I'm not really going to get into too much, but we all know the problems that Netanyahu's having and that his, you know, he's created this coalition that certainly includes these far-right holy warriors. Um, and um, so here's what Friedman writes. He says, going forward, that we want Hamas and Hezbollah, of course, these are the holy warriors of the Muslims. And by the way, they're, of course, not uh, supported by probably a majority of Muslims who think, please go away and let us live in peace. But uh, here's what uh, Friedman says here about Netanyahu. He says, Netanyahu's way forward here is that he has to reconnect himself with the liberal democratic Israel. So the modern Israel, not the traditional pre-modern Israel, ethnocentric Israel. So that the world and the region sees that this is not a religious war, but a war between the front lines of democracy and the front lines of theocracy. That means Netanyahu has to change his cabinet, expel the religious zealots, and create a national unity government. Uh, making sure that this is a modern defense, uh, not a pre-modern, I think is very good advice here. A um, couple other thoughts. One is just in general, that red is the problem <laughs> in this world. Uh, red is certainly the problem in the modern world. It is, again, it has the predator, prey, domination, submission kind of sensibility. Um, they know how to do both, but they prefer domination. We thought we got rid of it in our modern world, you know, in a way we have, you know, most of us live lives of safety and comfort, amazing in human history. That's true in Israel as well. And this starting Saturday is an example of how that eruption of red is uh, always there under the surface. And it's true in terms of crime. It's true in terms of geopolitics. And we really notice it when it's attack on the modern world. You know, when, when the, 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 you know, there's these Slavic wars and wars in Africa. And, you know, the, 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 it's as old as the hills, these fights within blue cultures. But when modernity is involved, like Ukraine, a modern enough country, at least modern aspiring, and Israel, then we no, notice it. It's like when crime comes to the suburbs, uh, then we take note. And um, But we one of the other things that Integral would show us is that, again, this is not new. 
Um, what they're doing now was Western Europe for centuries of religious war. And the Vikings and the Romans and the Chinese and history is war after war, incursion after incursion, killing children, women, kidnapping, enslaving, taking trophies, taking hostages, the American West. Um, it's unfortunately, you know, I don't get this planet sometimes, honestly. It's like, why did it have to be so hard? But this is, you know, it's a lot of human history and there's pockets of it here now. And that's what we're, that's what we're seeing. Uh, again, the cure is development. Um, the psych we talk about cycles of violence. And of course, you know, you think of the hundred years war in Europe. Cycles of violence, you know, violence begets violence, begets violence until it doesn't. And that cycle of violence doesn't hold when people become modern enough. And, you know, think of Germany and Japan after World War II. You know, think of what are the chances that Germany and France are going to go to war again? It's basically unthinkable. So we do want that to happen. You can't happen, make it happen that we've learned. We learned that in Iraq. Um, and um, so I think I'll stop there. And I'm just curious what you think. You know, what is your perspective on this? And and how does Integral help inform it? Okay, I got a lot of good questions and comments here. The first one is about how to guide policy so that it's more a modern response of pacification and containment than a pre-modern response, which is retribution and revenge. I mean, I've heard all kinds of perspectives on this, and we all have the media verse now is is amazing what, what we're learning. But the you know, Friedman talks about this today, and so does Brett Stevens, I think, in the New York Times, uh, and a lot of people that the prospect of Saudi Arabia and Israel normalizing relations was what precipitated Hamas I'm not, uh, I'm doing this because they wanted to derail that. And they probably have. Uh, for a while, because as I said, when life conditions change, people often get knocked down a notch or two. And so th they will have succeeded in that. And we'll see what Israel does in retribution. You know, what percentage of is Israel going to be level headed, which I love Net Netanyahu using that uh, term on the first night. He said a level-headed response. That's modern. That's good. You know, we want to contain this. We want to stop it. We want to, you know, uh, uh, snuff out the enemy, but not the civilians who might be willing to live in peace. And we don't want to, you know, feed that cycle of people who are, you know, in that pre-modern consciousness. So uh, we'll see what percentage of their response is that versus vengeance. And, um, and that, you know, so, yes, I think that will derail Saudi Arabia and a lot of this sort of the modern move in um, in the Middle East. But in a way, you know, the caravan moves on regardless. You know, there's an old Arab saying, dogs bark, but the caravan moves on. And the caravan is modernity. It's going to come. And, um, and, and, you know, the, the children, the grandchildren, and maybe before they're uh they're going to be fed up with this and you know we'll I, I think see that move but i don't know how soon next question what happens to hamas well it's kind of like isis they get eliminated you know i mean they really uh, you know at some point that you just gotta either put them in some kind of a jail or you kill them i mean that that is the way of things uh and uh you know, I don't like that. But again, this is the planet we're on. And I think that's how, that's where they end up unless they you know wake up. And it's interesting to see um, some of the interviews with ex-ISIS, you know, or ex-fanatics uh, of all stripes who at some point, sometimes they wake up. Uh, but, um, you know, if not, they have to be contained. Taken out. Okay, next question. What do I think about how all of this is being covered and transmitted in our new media? 
universe. I have to say that that when we talk about the evolution of culture, I think that's worth noting that we're in a uh, sort of a competition between the established uh, mainstream media, if you will, and social media. And for me, that is, you know, I, I'm, I'm firmly in the camp of, boy, am I glad we have both. Because when I want to get a visceral feel for what's going on and the, sort of the fog and the kaleidoscope of emerging events, uh, I go to Twitter. And I'm uh, very uh, careful with how I curate my Twitter. Twitter, I have my right list, I have my left list, I have this list, I have that list. And I want to listen to all of these people. And, you know, for the most part, um, assume that they're all coming from some sense of good faith. Red, good faith with red is always a little dicey, you know. <laughs> but um, th there's, th it's just, I can't imagine, if I think back on even 10 years ago or the Iraq war or whatever, uh, if, if I thought that I had to just pay attention to the networks and CNN, I would feel like there was a blanket that had put over over my uh, consciousness and my aware, you know, awareness of what's going on. So that's really important. But what's also important is to tune into the BBC or CNN, where or the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, where you know reporters have a modern standard or a postmodern standard, and it's not just perspectives coming at you. And um, and I appreciate what's going on with Twitter with. Elon Musk and his citizen journalism. There's a thing on um, in the Wall Street Journal this week on Musk push, pushes for more citizen journalism at X. Uh, and I appreciate that because it's, I don't know what algorithms they're using or, you know, how it's working in terms of programming, but it's a little bit like um, Wikipedia and that there's people checking people in real time. And is this true or is it not? Uh, that uh, is, it's an emergent in terms of hum the human noosphere that's worth noting. And uh, there was a line from Elon that, uh, he, it was a tweet he did a couple of days ago, where he said, and I love this, he said, well, first of all, I would say that Elon Musk is many people. And I did a podcast on him, the many Elon Musks, and that he's a spiral wizard because he can work with every stage, but that's another thing. But when he says this, he's my kind of guy. He says, as always on X, please try to stay as close as possible to the truth, even for stuff you don't like. This platform aspires, and I love this, to maximize signal slash noise of the human collective. And I like that. So um, that's what's happening. And I want to note that. Okay, then next I ask my hosts to share some of their thoughts. And first is Rigel Thurston, who hosts the Developmental Alliance meetings the second Wednesday of every month. And um, here's Rigel. I think, I think part of my resistance to wanting to watch the most horrendous of horrendous videos is part of, part of it's a fear of the, the rage of red that is in me, which makes me wonder if I'm <clears throat> just kind of pasting over a veneer of like integral uh sensibility because <clears throat> i i'm unable to really get myself to watch it um but a, another thing that i i noticed that gave me a little bit of hope is you know i'm i think there was a new york times article that had <clears throat> like a you know a man my age wearing adidas flip-flops and like a nike t-shirt carrying a baby and <clears throat> he was palestinian and 50 years ago I would have already been like deeply entrenched in my tribe um, of like all Palestinians are, uh, you know, evil. Um, but now uh, that's just impossible. I can't. I mean, he's holding a teddy bear that's made in China and like a little baby. And he's probably just woke up to like bombs dropping in his in his front yard. So anyways, there's a little that I have very complicated things happening inside of me. Thanks, Rigel. And next, I asked Steve McIntosh to weigh in. 
And Steve is the founder of the Institute for Cultural Evolution, and he is the author of many books on integral theory, including his latest, Developmental Politics, which I highly recommend. And here's Steve. I I think the, the, the most useful thing I can say is, okay, I, I am I'm committed to a view, a long-term view that all things work together for good, right? So how could this possibly work together for good? That was you know, horrific. And this is something that I um, began to touch on in a paper that I, uh, an article that I wrote right after the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris uh, called um, Cultivating uh, Cultural Evolution in Islamic Society. Uh, Jeff, you and I talked quite a bit about that paper that came out in 2020. Right on, yeah. Um, and I think one of the ways that, at least from a, an integral perspective, this could be framed, you know, looking at the long term of it, is to appreciate now, you know, first of all, there's Islamism, right? The kind of the militant death cult of ISIS and, you know, these other offshoots. And then there's Islam, which, you know, we're not, I'm not trying to equate the two, right? Islam is a Muslim civilization. These people are peaceful. I'm sure most of them are aghast by the violence, but there, there's certainly a high degree of sympathy for jihad in, uh, you know, on the Islamic street, as they say. Um, and, and part of that goes with, um, at least as I talk about in the paper, this idea that among all the world's great religions, Islam is is the, the least or the most resistant to modernity overall. And I said this in our small group, that we have reformed Christianity, we have reformed Judaism, we have reformed Hinduism. They've all kind of made their peace with modernity in various degrees. Um, and there are many you know, Islamic scholars and intellectuals in almost every country who have been arguing for decades that Islam needs a reformation. Right? This is not my idea. That's, you know, there's there's a a large consensus among Islamic modernists that uh, this is going to be necessary for the good of, of people who live in Islamic countries. Um, but as I try to get out in the paper, there may be good reason, you know, a thousand years from now, why, why Islam is the most to hold out against modernity. And, and part of that could be found in the fact that, it, that modernity's secularism threatens Islam more than perhaps any of the other great world religions, right? That, that, that you know, laïcité in France is something that they, you know, that they're more um, militant against. And and so I guess the, the, the quick point is that by holding out against modernity, by forcing modernity to be more friendly to the world's great religions, even in, in this twisted way of, you know, jihad as spiritual practice, I think there's something that, that modernity can take this in their stride in the long term, that the larger civil modernity, post-modernity, integral civilization as it comes, as a way of realizing that, that there's something really deep and important about the wisdom of the world's great religions that we haven't fully uh, included in our transcendence. And that ultimately, until we do include that in a way that can satisfy, maybe not the Islamists, but certainly the, you know, the, the folks of Islamic sensibilities, um, I, I think there's a way that we could take this in our stride and over time use it for the further growth of civilization. Yeah, beautiful. Well said. The next question is a good one, and that is how do pre-modern people move into modernity and get the peace and prosperity, but avoid the secular soullessness? You know, we don't want to move into the secular wasteland, spiritual, God is dead, um, uh, disenchanted world of modernity. Uh, religious and people who are living in an enchanted world particularly don't want that. And so what's the story? How can we bring that into uh, the modern, postmodern, and integral world? And I think the story of evolution does it, honestly. Evolution, the idea of, you know, something blowing out of nothing and the Big Bang and even maybe before the Big Bang or I don't know, whatever, but that more has arisen out of less for 14 billion years and cultures evolve and there's something going on here that is um, not just, you know, material, that there is an enchanted quality to evolution itself. And there's a teleology and there's a purpose to evolution and i too think steve's book evolution's purpose is one of my big books so yeah i think that uh re-enchanting the world is a big part of what will help people move through these earlier stages 
And the other thing I would say is that there is, um, when we talk about he healthy red, red wants to fight. Uh, it needs to fight. And one of the great things about social media is it gives us a nonviolent place to fight. We can literally choose our arena. We can get in the arena with other people and we can duke it out. And that is, I think, a very fruitful thing for humanity. Hum you know, when I think about evolution, it's like fighting and friending. Those two things are what makes the world go round. And uh, we want to do them in a way that is, you know, even fun. You know, fun's another quality of red. Red people know how to have fun. Uh, so, uh, you know, those are the things we want to be friendlier to. And I think... Um, you know, with all the criticism of social media, there's a lot of fruit that is coming out of it. Okay, and here's part two of this podcast. Uh, excerpts from my conversation with my weekly conversation partner, Ankur Delight. Hey, Ankur. Good morning, Jeff. Hey. Um, yeah, so this week we were going to talk about the tragedies going on in Israel and Palestine. And um, and you wrote back and said, I I checked it out and it's too much. And then you said, well, let's do it anyway. So yeah. uh, maybe we just start there. So where, where, where are you at, man? I'm in a better place than I was yesterday. So I'm give you a little bit of my background here. Um, I was really into the news. I was a news junkie in high school and college. Uh, I really prided myself on that. I got really into Chomsky. And so I was like deconstructing a lot of things from the Chomsky lens. And it was very, very helpful. Um, and I had a lot of anger, a lot of anger. And I was kind of, and I was very, I don't think I was really negative. You know, I mean, I, I've always had like a positive side, but I was just really pissed off. Just like the beginning when you get tuned into, you go from orange to green and get tuned into how just fucked up the world is, how unfair it is, and how me at Stanford as a person of privilege that I was basically benefiting from this unfairness and all of like the great things I had were on the backs of like inequality and racism and classes and all this shit. I was really upset and I realized that the news is not, was not good for me. And so I stopped and I basically haven't looked at the news for, you know, 10 or 20 years hmm. until we started doing this. And I'm like, Oh great. I got to look at the news to do the daily. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, and I think it's in service because, and I think a lot of my analysis is correct in that the news essentially plays a very negative role in people's lives and it doesn't empower us. And we have this expanded sense of concern, the circle of circle of concern, but our actual circle of influence is quite small. And it's ultimately disempowering and negative for our personal relationships and our sense of purpose and our sense of hope. So I think that is correct. And there's a part that's pathological, which is that I'm running away from my emotions. Yeah. And so the, when you invited me to this, I was like, all right, here we go. And I did. And I spent most of yesterday crying. Hmm. And I and I talked to a lot of friends. Um, and it was helpful. And, and I just cried in every conversation I had. And it was really good. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's important for me personally <laughs> mm -hmm. to do that and not to, um, not to resist that, you know. Yeah. And I did a lot of like physical emoting you know just a lot of stretching and movement and just mm -hmm. random sounds of mm -hmm. displeasure absolutely yes absolutely and, which i think is very helpful for me yeah yeah and then before going to bed i watched this video that you recommended that you recorded live he's referring to the talk i did in part one and i i found the first thing you did in that to be very helpful which is this this integral practice of being like so all of these major developmental stages are online in all of us and let's just tune in with each one's reaction and i think that was part of what was causing them i mean i had a lot of physical symptoms yesterday like like i had nausea the whole day you know and i think part of what was causing that is i have all these reactions of course like you know as a as a student 20 years ago i, I read like the whole history of those scene and i have the whole like rational understanding and framework of international law and like Israel this and you know that whole thing and then the whole injustice part of it and then just the tragedy of it all and also I have my tribal affiliation that I'd rather not you know I'd rather be above that but you know I'm like I'm as I came out of the left and so my tribal affiliation is with Palestine right and I'm aware of that 
And then I just have the red, just being very fucking angry at everybody involved. And I'm, you know, I can, I'm, I might just burst into tears on this call. Just I can feel it, of, you know, as a father. And you see, you know, you, I mean, I didn't see any pictures or video. And I would not, I'm not going to do that. But just what, re, what I read about just the dead children. And it's, just, I'm just pissed off at everybody. And it's, it's really, so I'm, I'm in touch with all of those. <laughs> all those levels are alive in me. Mm-hmm. And that's really, it was really helpful. Mm-hmm. And so I just want to suggest that, that like that practice if we, I think if we all did that practice, there could be a lot less of the unhelpful reacting. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I really, I encourage people to, um, not just to hear Jeff's explanation, which I think is wonderful, but actually to do it, you know, and it's really, yeah. it's powerful. And, and it's powerful with any, any issue, but this is really, I mean, for me, I mean, it's just me, but this is just really hitting me. Yeah. But I, I, I want to, like, I have a few points I want to make, but before that, there's something that I either don't understand or don't agree with in that in that categorization, which is attributing the sensitive self to green. Because mm-hmm. it, it seems it just seems counterintuitive to me. It seems like this the the sadness and the emotion of that would almost would be like even before red. It's mm-hmm. it's just like that that sadness is just always gonna be there. And the green has the like more of the justice type thing. Mm-hmm. But is there no, I think you're right. I, I, I no, I totally think you're right. right. And I think that's a really great insight, Encore, because yeah, that basic sadness, <laughs> the capital B, capital S, S, basic sadness, you know, that um, it, it's we start with that when we fall from paradise, when yeah. we become self conscious, that's part of the deal, and that's been with us the whole time. So thank you, I appreciate that. That broadens that out. Yeah, and it's, uh, so, it's just so sad. And and everyone, everyone I've ever met, you know, and this is where I like to go with people when I'm wandering through villages on a pilgrimage and stuff. We all they're all in touch with that, you know. Yeah. 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 I mean, what we could chart in terms of development is that the circle of what you're sad about gets bigger. Yeah. <laughs> so now we're sad about something that's happening on the other side of the world. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's the green and that's, you know, uh, but yes, you're right. Uh, and then green, of course, wants to right the wrongs and, uh, you know, the power, right the power dynamics and all of the stuff that we're seeing. That's that political side of green, which I, I talked about. I didn't mention this morning, but it's the part that criticizes modernity for its complicity in the creation of these red pockets of, um, you know, because red, we've, you've t- we've talked about, about this before, Encore. Red is the problem in the world. So this, this is where I'd like to, I want to dispute that. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, and it's, it's, this is going to be interesting because I'm, okay. you know, I'm going to try and bring a lot of nuance to this. Yeah. But if I were going to present, just I'll give you like the, the non-nuanced version. Like, because I know you, there's a lot of nuance to what you're saying. Yeah. And if we're going to reduce the complexity of what you're saying to one statement, you're saying red is a problem. And if I'm going to reduce the complexity of what I'm saying in one statement, I want to say that blue is a problem. Mm-hmm. And and to me, when I look at like all of the violence that's going on, it's it's the it's the pathological side of blue, right? The bad side of blue. Obviously, mm-hmm. there's a lot of maybe not obviously for people in orange and green, it's not obvious. But there are a lot of wonderful parts about blue, mm-hmm. and it's just the, the part of like community, having a creed, togetherness, the things that like are basically a lot of what we sacrificed in modern life of like actually caring about people, investing in people, having a sort of like reason to come together and believe the same thing, which without which our, our life is essentially meaningless. <laughs> That's the blue brings that, right? Mm-hmm. And so I, I honor that and it's beautiful. And I, it's part of my work in the world in my coaching program and my whole like public thing is to bring that back in a healthy way. So I'm down. And I feel like what's going on here is because of these, the the othering or the like my team versus your team, my story versus your story is so strong, we're able to use all of the other tools, which primarily I think are probably like red tools and orange tools, um, for division for violence. And so some of it's violence, but some of it's just like the administrative bureaucratic state and technology and the apparatus of that 
it's like it's like why there's this um incongruity between this horrific rocket mass rocket attack and like why then why what happened what did what did israel do the day before and they'll say like, the violence of the state in the way that things are being administered and laws are being applied and all that has been going on for all this time and it's just not as um it's not as sexy as red but we can see it's still You're talking about the administrative state of israel on uh, 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 palestine or yeah 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 just like the occupation right the occupation yeah right so it's like that's that's totally. the totally. yeah. tool in this war that is just not as sexy right totally. but they're both i mean it's, it's and they're both what i'm saying is they're both fueled by this desire by this kind of like you're not me fuck you i'm going to use all the tools at my disposal to mess with you and then they, they come out looking differently and sometimes it's like I mean, it's always horrific but sometimes you and i notice how horrific it is like this week yeah but in terms of the like you know from a spiritual point of view it was just as horrific for everybody involved there last week yeah you know and like no one in israel is you know my understanding ha has had any sense of safety or security for decades yeah obviously this makes it like worse but it's not like last week they were they were just like super peaceful down at the core like it's going to be great you know it's like it's oh no. no no one over there has been safe for for decades no no one over there can feel feel that peace for decades right it's like not yeah yeah so and what i you know i was talking to a friend of mine who's, a, who's a, a rabbi and we had a very constructive and difficult you know conversation about this yesterday but one of the one of the things we talked about because we're both interested in gandhi and martin luther king it's kind of ways in which this situation is is different and there's a lot of that we could we could get into but one of the things that i why i think this conflict is so important for all of us is that in order to get nonviolence to work in the gandhian example or the martin luther king example there's still a pretty clear like green dynamic of oppression of like these guys are the colonial assholes and these guys are the freedom fighters and there's a pretty clean like blue thing of like these are the good guys and these are the bad guys mm -hmm. going on when you when you see what was going on and like you know racism in the 60s and whatnot but here it's just like everybody has been just really blowing this for a while and it's not like there's a clean good guy bad guy scene from either the green or the blue perspective mm -hmm. and i and so the only way in my as in my estimation and the the only way to get beyond this is to enlarge in that circle of who is us versus who is them to include the other side where you didn't have to do that in um in to get independence in india like i mean gandhi was like there and wanted to do that but for the most people it was just like we're going to unite we're going to follow gandhi's example we're going to be nonviolent, but we didn't actually have to see the british as the same people as we are and we and we just wanted them to leave and they had a place to go right but in this situation it's not like anyone's going to leave or anyone has a place to go that's just a fantasy you know like and i you know i lived in lebanon for a while 20 years ago i worked in shatila camp palestinian refugee camp taught creative writing there for a while and the people there they had like the key around their neck to their houses and the map to their orange groves and i was you know and i'm still learning the history of this and i was like oh when did you get when did you leave you know so this doesn't make sense with the timeline this is 2003 you're 40 years old and they're like no no i've never been there it's my father's or something and they, and they, it's just like this, it's this fantasy that is, it's like not gonna, no one's ever gonna leave that, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, it, and, and so it's not like- You're talking about that the, these the people would not be leaving their homeland, would not be leaving their father's orchards. No, no, I mean, like they got kicked out. Yeah. They lost. They lost the might versus right battle. They yeah. did not have the might, they yeah. lost. Yeah. And there's not like, there's not some solution in which like, the state of Israel is going to dissolve and all these people are going to leave and be like, no, actually, we we fucked that up. You guys should just come back. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's not it's not how it's right. going to be. Right. And, it, and, it, and it's like the other side, it's not like you're going to be able to obliterate every single Palestinian and be like, oh, good. We solved that problem in the way the Nazis wanted to solve the problem with the Jews. It's like these are not solutions in the rational world. Nope. Like the only way that this is going to work is if we enlarge the circle and be like okay we're going to get over this whole blue thing from because our like rational because we understand it's only leading us to to, to death yeah on a rational level yeah. and it's going to it's going to we're going to like sacrifice and put aside these affiliations 
to be able to like try and construct a future together. Yeah. So for me, and this is what I feel like is missing, and I don't I don't know where this goes in the integral scene, but it's like I the way I my vocabulary for it is we have to open the heart to the other side's pain. And as long as I have this affiliation that like I, I have a discussion with somebody and they're justifying what Israel is doing because what Hamas is doing is so bad, mm -hmm. or they're justifying like what the Palestinians or what Hamas is doing because what Israel had done for decades is so bad. As long as you're focused on what the other person is doing, we're missing the point. No, absolutely. And I think what you're describing is actually, you know, it sort of starts in modernity, but it's an integral view. In this case, if you are able to not contract around the Israel's bad storyline or the Palestinians are bad storyline, and able to hold the whole, you know, an ever bigger story and ever bigger view. It's like you're talking about increase the circle. Um, I think, first of all, that's that's sort of happening in the brutal way of evolution. War is sort of a means of that sometimes. You know, it's just you just get in the arena and you beat each other's brains out. And you know, as we've talked about before, wars are ultimately once they move through the traditional stages of development into people get modern, people get hip to it. Uh, the cycle of violence ends. Uh, you know, it traditional and earlier, there's cycles of violence, revenge, and that sort of thing. When people become modern, think of the Japanese and the Germans after World War II. Um, they become modern in five years, you know, 10 years. Uh, they're no longer a threat to the world. Um, that is a, an amazing thing. And so we do want um, people to develop that modern sensibility where I can live with people that I don't have an ethnocentric connection to. And there's a lot of people and, and there's a higher proportion of that in the Arab world. They're just the developmentally, that's where the- this, this, is the, this is the part I, I didn't, really think was helpful in, in what you guys were talking about yesterday. Okay. Because it's like, I mean, the whole, the premise of the state of Israel is ethnocentric. Eth right? Yes. It's not like they're like, they're not like, hey, we want to have this like secular inclusive state and you guys don't like it. And that like, I mean, that Sam Harris quote, I yeah. mean, it's essentially just slander. Like nobody knows what's going on in the future. And he's just like, it's just, a, it's just a diss that, had, that is totally, in my perspective, not useful. It's just, it's just like an insult. And it's not, I mean, we're not going to, no, no side is going to not do violence at this point. Right. So it's just, you, you know, it's, I mean, I see what you're saying in terms of this, there's certain ways in which, I mean, Israel is definitely like a modern state in, in ways that some of these other communities are not, but there's lines of development, you know, in these different areas. And it's not, there's certainly not uniformity along those lines of, no, not at all. you know, and like this wouldn't be happening if, I think if one of these people were fully modern, this wouldn't be happening. No, I think you're right. I do. I think for a so-called modern state, Israel has a far higher uh, uh, proportion of blue and red. And, um, you know, I think it's understandable in that people who were attracted to Israel in the homeland were the ethnocentric Jews. Yeah. They came from all over the world there because they that rang their ethnocentric bell. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's huge in Israel. It's more so than it would be in countries in Western Europe. You know, that's so and the, the Jewish diaspora in the West is far more liberal yeah. than, um, you know, so, no, th th that's true. I, I th there's a there's definitely a red aggressive conquering uh, element in Israel uh, and uh, and there is in the Arab world and they're both growing out of it. Uh, and, and there isn't like, you know, it's, it's different, but there isn't in, in me and you, right? It's like, it's, and that's, that's what I feel like is so hard and beautiful about this. And, you know, my personal experience of it is it just wakes, it wakes me up to it. And, and yeah. whether it's my relationship with an estranged friend or my father or whatever, it's like this, this thing of un, being unable to recognize someone else's pain and just focus on my own pain or my tribe's pain is what's blocking my growth and all of our growth. Well it's so horribly 
demonstrated you know they're doing they're doing this like service for us and, and it just it's just like oh god it's just and you know and maybe one th one thing i think you're getting to I, I cut you off is how the the brutality of war just destroys i mean it should destroy you know, it's 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 breaking down against our ideological defenses into thinking that our side is a good guy mm -hmm. whereas now it's like very clear for me and I hope it's, you know, this is what I want it to be very clear for everyone who's watching this, that is affiliated in any way with either side, your side is the bad guy. Mm -hmm. There are no good guys. Like these people are all, this is all, this is all just bad guy stuff. And the narrative of like, my side is the good guy and your side is the bad guy. It's just, it's, it's poison. Yeah. We're never going to get to like non-killing of babies through yeah. that. Yeah. 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 I mean, certainly in this case, I mean, I think um, I'm, I'm not sure I would agree with that in sort of the whole way you're presenting it. Um, I do see I, I find myself arguing for modernity and it's a provisional argument in a way because modernity is less violent by radically less violent than traditionalism and uh, tribalism. And that is something we have to take into account. Uh, they violate, you know, you know, they dominate in different ways. They may dominate economically, they may dominate culturally, but they don't, don't dominate in war uh, as much as traditional people. I mean, every modern state has a traditional underbelly, so it gets activated. Uh, and I think that's worth noting. But my argument isn't that modernity is better than traditionalism, because the move into modernity requires the repression of a lot of traditionalism. Every stage wants to re repress the previous one. And, um, and so that's always gonna be problematic. And from an integral perspective, we wanna go back and sort of correct that repression. So just to use the more abstract kind of ideas here, modernity comes in with this idea of, um, you know, we no longer need religion. We can explain the world scientifically. And so does that make modernity better than traditionalism? No, because it just disenchanted the world. You know, that's a bad thing, but that's the nature of growth. And you get to the next stage and the next stage. And finally, you get to the stage where you look back and you see, look at all this stuff that we've repressed and put in shadow that is part of the human condition, including red. You know, including sexy, fun, playful red, you know, powerful red. Look at me, red. Um, we want all of that. And so the move through the spiral is a fucking catastrophe. And, and you know, and we're seeing it. And it's very, um, you know, it's tough to say right and wrong. I mean, right and wrong is... Uh, it, like I said, that's sort of one sort of stage where you'd look at that. When you get beyond that conformist stage that starts being that feels like a question that i don't even want to think there i mean it, it i don't you know it it's it just doesn't engage me because i could see so much more so anyway i i just want to make that point that when i argue for modernity i'm not arguing for modernity in the whole mm -hmm. i'm just noticing that modernity has qualities and and being pacified is one of them and you know all of the other good stuff uh that is new in human history yeah 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 for, for sure for sure well maybe this is when we don't get all figured out yeah <laughs> okay well that's it folks thanks for listening to the daily evolver thanks to the developmental alliance for inviting me on the other night and uh, you can join the Developmental Alliance. I encourage you to if you're interested in this sort of thing. Check them out uh, online. You can Google, Google them. They're part of the Institute for Cultural Evolution. And also thank you to Ankur Delight. Uh, Ankur and I are live on YouTube every Thursday at 11 a.m. You can join us live and we often post the resulting conversation as well. So yeah, that's it. Also, Integral Life, I'm on every third, uh, I'm sorry, second and fourth Wednesday at 2 p.m. Mountain Time uh, through Integral Life. It's the um, Integral Life Practice Community. 
And that's it. My pug's about to bark. So I'm going to sign off. Jeff Salzman, see you next time.